Good morning. Welcome to worship this gloomy, cold, rainy November morning, November 22nd, here at New Town United Methodist Church. I'm not sure what the weather is like where you're viewing this, but I hope that you are uh, keeping warm and safe. Today is uh, not only Christ the King Sunday, but it's also a Thanksgiving Sunday and a time where we'll be committing uh, our pledges to the church. So I want to remind everybody uh, that if you brought a pledge card today, um, would like to have it on the altar, Sue will be coming around to your cars, and if you have one to give to her, please do so and make sure those are on the altar as well. If you don't have your pledge card with you today and have not yet made a pledge, I encourage you to prayerfully consider your gift to the church in 2021. Again, the church understands some of you are out of work, some of your circumstances have changed. Do not feel bad if you have to uh, put your pledge down a little bit less next year or uh, aren't able to pledge at all. But I would encourage, as I've said in, my new, in the newsletter, if you have been blessed and are able to increase your pledge and therefore help out those who have to decrease their pledge, we work together as a church family. So all is dedicated to God and all is good and Christ is good and we will have a good year ahead, but that in involves your pledge. So please, if you haven't made a pledge, do so soon and uh, let uh, Phyllis at the office know. We have about one-third of our pledges in, so many of you have yet to uh, submit your pledge. If we don't hear from you, we'll probably assume it's status quo, but let us know either way. Okay, that was a long walk around the garden, but I wanted to get that out of the way. I want to remind everybody that we do have our annual church conference. Sometimes it was called a charge conference. It's a church conference that will be Monday night tomorrow at 7 o'clock via Zoom. And it's going to be led by Dean Feldmeyer, retired pastor who's associated with Church of the Savior Montgomery, uh, becoming a friend of mine, and he'll be leading the charge conference. And then uh, we invite you to join it. If you can, it's open to every member of the church. If you'd like to be a part of that, send me an email, let me know, and I will send you the Zoom link. Several of our members have already done that. So if you want to be part of that, I'll send you the link. And then all you have to do on Monday night is click on the link. And if you don't have the Zoom app, uh, just let it install the app. You'll be in the room for the charge conference. Okay, uh, I guess, oh, one other thing. We had a prayer concern come in since uh, Beth got her list. Uh, you, you'll hear in a moment, uh, Beth will share some families dealing with COVID. We received uh, last couple of days, Kathy Marthas shared that her son, Sean, has tested positive for COVID. So keep Sean and his family in your prayers as well as all the other people that we are lifting up dealing with COVID. And it seems like it's going to be more and more. So let's prayerfully uh, keep one another in our prayers and in our thoughts. Okay, well, it's good to have you here. If you're in the parking lot and can hear my voice, please honk your horn. Okay, you're still with me. That's good. So we'll continue with worship by hearing the announcements for the morning from Beth. Morning. These are your announcements for Sunday, November 22nd. Let me take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving this coming Thursday. I know it's going to look very different than the years past. It is for myself and my family too. We can still give God thanks for his grace and all of his blessings he has bestowed on us all this past year. I think God is ready to move forward from 2020 as well. In any case, let us still give thanks for all that we do have and try not to focus on what 2020 has thrown at us. <clears throat> Today is the last day to donate to the IPM Christmas Tree Mission. Please place your donation in an envelope, mark it appropriately, and place it in the offering box at the back door. Pam Roy would like to encourage all who would like to attend her Bible study but not get the book to join anyway, as the author, Adam Hamilton, will be chatting through the video. Please reach out to Pam to participate. In finance, tithes and offerings are $129,860 versus a budget of $121,552. I want to say thank you to Trudy Flowers, G. Gibson, and Kathy Preesing for making baby blankets for the Christmas Help Center. They will be grateful to receive them. In joys and concerns, Diane has had several interviews and hopes to hear something by the end of the month. Please pray that one of those is a perfect fit for her. Charlotte Eicholtz, her daughter Kim, and granddaughter Hannah are recovering from COVID. They are still very tired, but are working their way to the end of it. Prayers for their continued recovery. Please continue to pray for Cy and Piper Gibson. And as always, prayers for the safety of our frontline workers, first responders, teachers, staff, and students during this pandemic. 
See you all next week, everyone. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. The voice of Jesus calls his people like a shepherd calls the flock. Come, follow me. We follow Jesus because we long to learn a world-changing way of loving and because we are inspired by his deeply courageous compassion. We follow Jesus because he is faithful and constant again and again he brings our wandering spirits back to find peace and comfort with him. Jesus is calling us in this moment and always. Here we are, Jesus. Guide us, O Christ. Please join me in the invocation. Today, God calls on us again to be God's own people, to recommit all of who we are to serving God and loving one another. We are here today because God is in this place. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us be still and listen to what God is speaking today. May the God who blesses us be blessed by us. Amen. Please join me in the Psalter, Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord who made us is God. We are the Lord's. We are the people of God, the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God's name. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's faithfulness to all generations. Our reading this morning is an Old Testament lesson, Ezekiel chapter 34, 
verses 11 through 16 and 20 through 24. God, the true shepherd. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, choir, for that medley of Thanksgiving songs. We have so much to be thankful for. So thankful to be together today. So let me pray before I preach, and please be an adjunct of prayer with me. Dear Lord, we are thankful for this time together. Very much aware of your blessings, at the same time very much aware of that which gets in the way of our love, distracts us from your peace. So I pray for your Holy Spirit to guide me not only in the preaching of this word this morning, but in reconnecting with all of us, reminding us that we are forgiven, we are loved, we are saved by Christ, and that you desire to draw close to us. So draw close to us this morning and use the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to give you praise and glory and guide us to be your church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I always know a sermon's off to a great start when I have to begin with a couple of disclaimers, but that's the way it's going to be today. Because I named this sermon Rounding Up the Herd, and I want to say a couple of disclaimers. First of all, I'm not suggesting that we're going to be coming back into the sanctuary real soon. That would, you know, people might say, oh, Pastor Bruce, rounding up the herd, he's going to get us back in church together again. Well, that's not going to happen. As you know, the CDC has announced nationwide that they're advising everyone to stay home this Thanksgiving. Now, of course, it's just an advising, and you don't have to necessarily have to follow that, but I know uh, our governor, Mike DeWine, is going to be Zooming with his family. They are canceling their family plans, and I encourage you to stay safe. It's very hard for me to imagine an empty sanctuary without you, but I want everyone to stay safe. So when I say rounding up the herd, I'm not implying that we're going to be back in worship. Okay, that's the first disclaimer. Second disclaimer, I'm not suggesting that herd immunity is going to work either. Now, I know back in the day, you know, parents would have uh, chicken pox parties or measles parties where some kid would be infected, and they said, well, let's get all the kids together. And they'll catch it right at an early age, and they'll, you know, they get over it easier, and uh, then they'll take care of everything. Well... That never quite worked, and actually, as I read up on herd immunity, what herd immunity actually means is that if a particular community has about 90% of people that have been uh, effect infected by the virus and seen their way through and have built up an immunity, then that's what's called herd immunity. Herd immunity is a result of everybody getting the virus. So we don't want herd immunity either. We want to keep patiently waiting for the vaccines and the other treatments. And also pray, pray for a decrease and the number of people admitted to emergency rooms and hospitals because they're all overwhelmed and our first uh, first row uh, first responders at all these places are getting burned out and tired so we want to keep them in our prayers and we want to do our part to stay healthy and safe okay then what do i mean when i talk about rounding up the herd well i'm talking about what a shepherd does and if, if there's an image of shepherd i'd like you to hold fast today is uh, from the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That kind of shepherd. The shepherd that Jesus talks about that goes out and seeks lost sheep. That's God. That's God's love. That's God at work for us. And I want to just take a few moments to focus on that and then focus about our relationship with the shepherd. Okay, the passage of scripture that Linda read so, so beautifully this morning is from Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was a prophet who was talking to a people of people, the people of Judah, that were uh, defeated by Babylon, uh, many of them captured and taken into Babylonian captivity, and consequently they saw the temple destroyed, leveled to the ground. Their temple, their holy place, not only destroyed, but removed from uh, Judah and Jerusalem in total. These words from the prophet are to encourage them that God has not forgotten about them or forsaken them, and is preparing them to return eventually back to uh, Judah, back to Jerusalem, back to the temple. And he talks about them as being lost sheep. And he says, I'll bring them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses and all the inhabited parts of the land. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak but the fat and the strong I will destroy, I will feed them with justice. He talks about, quite boldly, uh, God judging the very people that were 
fat and happy, you know, ones who kind of collaborate with Babylon, those ones who were, were indeed uh, able to compromise their faith and somehow benefit from that. But God knows that so many people are bruised and battered and in need of reclamation. So God promises through the prophet that God will gather them up together and will bring them back to that, that pasture, that, that safe and abundant place of God's love and God's promise and God's joy. And I think that's so important for us to remember that the God we celebrate, the God we, we find in Jesus Christ, is a God that always reaches out to those who are broken, those who are battered, those who are bruised, those who are brokenhearted. God wants to bind up those wounds, bring healing, comfort, and peace. And the one thing, one of the reasons I, I think worship on Sunday is so important is that we gather together to seek a God who can minister to us. But we also gather together to be with one another, to realize that all of us have our difficult challenges, all of our, us have our difficult times, and if there's one thing I know about God's wisdom is that we do not all suffer this together. We do not all have the same misfortune or the same challenges. There are always people around us who have either been through those things before and can help us along the way, or people who are just good friends and are able from a place of strength and security to walk alongside of us. That's how God's love works. None of us needs to be by ourselves. None of us needs to be forgotten. None of us ought to be forgotten. We all need to know God's love. As sheep know the shepherd, we need to open up ourselves to the love of God. Having said that, I think we need to consider the possibility of changing from sheep into more like the shepherd. I'm not suggesting a reverse werewolf thing where, where a person becomes a sheep, or a sheep becomes a shepherd. Rather, That's a reverse werewolf. An animal becomes a human being. No, I'm saying that the role of sheep and shepherd are both important, but we are called to be shepherds as well as sheep. Let me just explain that. As people of God, as people in need of direction and help and aid, many of us are bruised and battered, broken, discouraged at this time. And if that is your case, you need God to love you first. You need to, you know, stay a sheep for a while. Let somebody care for you. Don't be resistant to people that want to help you. Don't put off those doctor visits or those vaccinations or those opportunities that are there for people to come to your aid. If you need financial help, do not refuse government assistance. Do not refuse family members who want to help you. Take everything you can because God wants you to know that you are loved and you are cared for. So allow God to touch your heart and in your quiet moments, allow God to enter into you your heart and give you that peace which passes all understanding. That's very important. So if you are in need, if you're bruised, battered, neglected, ignored, broken, forgotten, let God heal you. Let God bless you. Stay a sheep for a while. But on the other hand, if you know you are loved, if you know you have been blessed, if you know that you are forgiven, if you know that you have been redeemed, if you know that you are a child of God, if you know you've been given gifts of love, compassion to share, if you know, if you know that God has blessed you, now it's time for you to be a shepherd. Now it's time for you to care for others. You need to be the one that Jesus sends out in his name with the authority of Christ to love and care for the world. That's the incredible thing about the church, you see. We are gathered together as God's sheep and we are cared for by God. But then we are totally to reach out in Christ when we know that we have been loved. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, knew this very well. He understood that God comes to us by grace. We don't ask for God's grace. But then through Christ, we receive God's grace, love, and mercy. But after we have been received that justifying grace, after we know God's love for sure, Wesley believed that then it's our opportunity for the rest of our lives to strive to be more like Christ to allow God's grace to help us to grow and to change and to love and to care. You know, in the best of families, and you know, this is probably a minority report, but in the best of families, this happens very naturally. If love is present, you see, parents take care of their kids, they, and then they walk along with each other for a while, 
And then grandparents take care of grandkids, uh, cousins take care of one another, and then eventually when mom and dad need care and assistance, the adult children are there to make, help them make decisions, the grandkids are there to help out, and everything flows naturally. Because along the way in family, you see, you begin to learn the skills and the gifts, you get to learn one another and care for them more. I honestly believe that for my mother and father-in-law, for example, I had to be their son-in-law for a couple of decades, maybe three decades, and our relationship grew to the point where I could actually be of more help to them because we knew one another better and we trusted one another to care for one another. That's how God's love works. God's love is there for us to care for one another. Which brings me around to our pledges for the church. Well, we're committed, Commitment Sunday, so you had to know I would be talking about this. But let me say one thing. When we, when we talk about the work of the church, when we think about what we're going to pledge for the work of the church, when we think about the first fruits that we would give back to Christ, what do we give our money for? Now, for years and years, as I was a pastor, I would see these, these campaigns come up every fall where they said, if you want to get your people to give, you have to give them, uh, show them what their money is used for. Don't just give them figures. Break it down. Show them what's used for mission. Show them what's used for the building. Show them what's used for the connection. In other words, show them what, they're, what bang for the buck they're going to get. And I always kind of, I understood the logic of this, but I always kind of resisted it. Because for me, it's just looking at the church as a consumer would look at the church. You know, somebody says, why do you give the church? Well, you know, our church has a gym. Our church has, you know, jazzercise. Our church has, you know, they have uh, <clears throat> great stuff for the kiddies. And on and on it goes. All right, well, that's why we give? Not actually. We give because God first gave to us. Now here's where the rubber hits the road. I honestly believe with all my heart that when we gather together to give back to God, we shouldn't be asking God, what have you done for me lately? What has the church done for me lately? Even though, believe me, Newtown has done a lot for me. But no, the question we should ask is, God, what will you have me do for the world? God, what are you calling me to do to reach out beyond the church? What are you calling me to do to care more for one another? What have I been sitting on that I really need to use? What are the ways in which you can utilize us to reach out to the world? Well, you see, being the church at work in the world is much more than taking care of ourselves. And I honestly think, I mean, <clears throat> speaking for millennials, and I really can't, <clears throat> but I do think for younger people, millennials and people younger who are wondering about the church, we need to show them that the church really matters. We need to show them that the church is concerned about them, concerned about life, concerned about the environment, concerned about the poor, concerned about the neglected, concerned about the hungry, concerned about the things that concern all people. And to do that, you see, requires that we go out into the wilderness go out into our communities with the love and the kindness of Christ. Oh, to be sure, <clears throat> excuse me, be, to be sure, I think um, I want to see us, especially after COVID, to have more activities, more programs, more ecumenical ministries with other churches and with agencies. I want us to be more and more actively involved in programming, that this might be a seven-day-a-week church. That, for sure. But more important than that, I want people to think about New Town United Methodist Church as not only a sanctuary, not only a safe place, not only a mission station, but a sending agency. Christ sending us out into the world, blessed, forgiven, and there to care for one another. That's the thing. If there's a herd to round up, we got a lot of work to do. There are so many people that are, that are just awash and, and discouraged and brokenhearted because they really don't see much hope in the future. We are people of hope. There are people that don't really know love or compassion or friendship. We are people of love, compassion, and friendship. I know, I know, just because the church has always been that for me. And as I've tried to open up my eyes to see all our many blessings, I've also seen the church at work in the world. That is what I think Christ calls us to do. 
it's interesting that there's basically two, two final words that Christ gives to us in the Bible. Uh, one, of course, is the Great Commission, you know, where Jesus sends us out, you know, go out into all the world, baptizing and teaching in my name. Well, that's great. But Jesus also says we are to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, visit the prisoner, announce the coming of the kingdom of God. This as well as the other. If we truly want to go out and love the world as Christ loves us, we have got to reach people who don't know the love of Christ. We cannot simply keep it to ourselves. It's a wonderful treasure. It's a wonderful blessing. And everyone that discovers this, discovers the greatest thing in the world. So let's realize that the herd we have to round up isn't ourselves. It's not getting more people in the church by getting the church into more people. It's not, you know, bringing people to Christ here, but going forth with Christ to reach more people. We are blessed to be a part of Christ's church. We are honored to go forth in his name. We are empowered by the authority of Christ to pray for healing, peace, and joy, and to show our love in so many ways. The world needs love. So may God guide us all in this time of pandemic to come up with new ways to reach out and then to anticipate with great joy and excitement the new ways which we can truly allow this to reach the world when we are free to roam, free to knock on doors, free to gather together, free to share meals together, free to sing together, free to be thankful together. This true still will pass, but may God use this time of reflection to strengthen us for the work ahead. Thanks be to God, now and always. Amen. And now at this time we're going to be uh, dedicating our gifts to God. And because the microphone is here and the, uh, the offerings are on the, on the altar, I'm going to bring, just for a moment, I'm going to bring the, uh, the offering plate in front of the camera where, uh, thank you, the pledges have been received. We'll offer up the ones today and we will anticipate your giving in the year ahead. So uh, please prepare for the prayer of dedication. We're going to do this responsibly. It's in the bulletin if you have it. And uh, let me just take a moment to get the offering tray. There we go. All right. I think that's got everything in the camera. Let's join responsibly in the prayer of dedication. We dedicate our gifts to you, O God. Help us to use them to glorify you, to be vessels of your work in this world. We dedicate our pledges to you, O God. Guide our leaders as as they prepare us financially for the upcoming year. Use us, O God, to do your work in this world. Encourage us to see that we are all ministers called into the body of Christ. Use us in our service. We pray over these gifts, blessing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'm so thankful that uh, Dee Dee shared uh, this prayer uh, written by uh, Dear Abby, Abigail Van Buren this Thanksgiving prayer. So we'll join and sing, say this prayer in unison as a Thanksgiving prayer for this week and for every day. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for food and remember the hungry. We thank Thee for health and remember the sick. We thank Thee for friends and remember the friendless. We thank Thee for freedom and remember the enslaved. May these remembrances stir us to service, that thy gifts to us may be used for others. Amen. Now let me offer the benediction. Friends, as we leave, let us go out with peaceful hearts, knowing that Jesus, the Good Shepherd, provides for our needs. Let us go now, taking peace with us to share. Amen. Go forth in love, joy, and peace, and have a blessed Thanksgiving.